Hello everyone, I'm Ben Davidson. This is my family. My wife and I founded Space Weather News and the Mobile Observatory Project. I'm the author of the textbook, Weatherman's Guide to the Sun. I also have peer-reviewed papers on solar terrestrial physics, and right now, I am 100% devoted to making the seemingly complex topic of solar forcing of the terrestrial climate as absolutely simple for you to understand as possible. If you have been following here, and the climate science the mainstream media seems to be refusing to cover, then 2019 was an interesting year. Following bombshells in 2018 from Princeton regarding the cooling potential of clouds, which makes us think about our cosmic ray cloud-inducing future, and from Yale regarding the cold climate bomb waiting to be unleashed by the Arctic, 2019 saw hundreds of university researchers breaking stride from the mainstream narrative on man-made global warming. Some of the more notable ones were from Harvard, which jumped in on both the oceans and the atmosphere. The American Geophysical Union devoted an enormous amount of time to significant solar climate forcing at their fall meeting. It was a quasi-taboo topic just a few years ago. We heard the World Meteorological Organization, which is the daddy of the IPCC, condemn the climate extremism as being factually wrong, unscientific, akin to religious extremism, and bordering on terrorism. The basis of the lack of factual correctness comes with confusion between scenarios and predictions. The IPCC does not do the latter, and in fact says it is impossible, something NASA's guidelines say as well. Too many moving parts we just don't understand. And all of this comes ahead of the 2022 major IPCC climate report. It will be the first one ever to account for solar particle forcing and cosmic rays. Here today, we are going to explain to you what's happening in the climate game, especially since the news won't seem to report it. We'll show you why this was a necessary change made by the IPCC and the rationale behind the change. Then, we are going to examine what's still missing and the exact roadmap for mainstream climate science to cross the finish line. Let's begin with carbon dioxide. This is changing due to human activity and natural variability to the tune of parts per million. Now, this tiny fraction has long been believed to have great power over the climate due to a number of closed system experiments done in the lab in the past. But these don't mimic the Earth as this is not at all a closed system. Ergo, the recent IPCC changes. Moving up to solar irradiance, the light of the sun. It changes by 0.1% or by the thousandths over the 11-year sunspot cycle. This is still 100 to 1,000 times greater variability than what we're seeing with carbon dioxide, but somehow still comes up short in the models. Well, now fast forward to today, and we're forgetting the fractions, because what's going into the models into the future is going up by orders of magnitude when it comes to particle variation. And we are still to this day discovering exactly how these particles are interacting with aerosols in the atmosphere, how they affect atmospheric electricity and cloud formation. The first aspect of this is cosmic rays, and in this, they are indeed making incredible strides. Cosmic rays come from tremendous space phenomena like supernova or cosmic jets. They often come from galaxies far away, and still arrive with tremendous energy. Unlike photons, like gamma rays, which are in the central column, cosmic rays are atomic nuclei. High-energy protons are heavier atoms with their electrons stripped. You see them over to the sides. These create incredible particle cascades of the subatomic nature, not to mention their own gamma ray photons. Cosmic rays cause cooling of the Earth and ionization of the atmosphere. And just picture this, given those particle cascades. Clouds form as water droplets and dust and other aerosols come together. The cosmic ray particles are deposited into the atmosphere, neutralizing or attaching to dust and becoming cloud condensation nuclei. They also strike other particles and ionize them, making them more attractive to dust and water vapor by the same static attraction force that works like a Swiffer duster in your home. The sun's activity directly controls how many cosmic rays enter the inner solar system, and so cosmic rays rise and fall opposite of the solar activity cycle, which has been reported in numerous cloud datasets. Of course, the sun itself is the primary producer of particle interaction with the Earth. Some particles sneak past Earth's magnetic field along the interplanetary magnetic field lines, but most is in the form of the solar wind and its interaction with Earth's magnetic field its heating of the atmosphere, its modulation of the global electric circuit, 
This is the process still to be officially understood and recognized by even those introducing the particle forcing into the equation today. Earth has a mini version of the solar wind. It comes from two places. First is the equator, the equatorial ion fountain, an ion release from the upper ionosphere that is not strong enough to escape like the sun's solar wind. In fact, the lowest L shells and Van Allen belts nicely contain them, forcing them back down into the atmospheric circuit. It's actually not exactly at the equator, but at the magnetic equator. Now the other place it comes out is at the poles, just like you see with cosmic jets from newborn stars, active galaxies, and quasars. It's called the polar wind or polar ion wind, and this actually can escape, mostly along Earth's magnetic fields, at which point it is blown back by the solar wind, either into the reaches of deep space or back into the circuit on the midnight side of the system. Now, for the simplest way to demonstrate how this process affects the atmosphere, imagine a strong solar flare releases a coronal mass ejection, which strikes Earth's magnetic field, some of which gets directly integrated into Earth's magnetic field and then down into the atmosphere, and the charged particles block out cosmic rays, and indeed we see cloud levels thin and coverage percentage drop during these impacts. But also there is the strong compression of the magnetic field, and the redirection of both the ion fountain and Van Allen electrons down into the atmosphere, combining with the particles deposited there by the magnetic field integration, and here is what happens. We now have more electric particles in the same size circuit of the atmosphere. Well, smaller actually because one side of it is compressed. And also, the solar energetic particles coming with the large flares also add to that mix. And the atmospheric global electric circuit is now the recipient of those particles. And stronger current means stronger downflow and high pressure, stronger upflow and low pressure, driving pressure differentials, intensification, increased storm activity, and atmospheric heating due to the direct particle interactions, and induced current ohmic heating through Earth's resistive atmosphere. So in one CME event, we have lower cloud cover and therefore lower cooling, increased electric heating and direct particle heating, intensification of the weather, and folks, this is what shows up in the climate record. Not joking. This was a huge point in our climate forcing movie, which is linked below and a must watch if you are interested in this topic. And this occurs because the sun's energy scales up from ultraviolet to x-rays in the large solar flares. This is more absorbed in the ionosphere than in the upper atmosphere, which is where they gauge solar forcing. And because the giant plasma cloud CME blocks out a tiny fraction of the light, we also get this dip. They're working together to create this drop in the apparent solar forcing. So, while the sun's input to Earth is actually jumping 10 to 10,000 times, or in some cases, 100,000 times or more, there shows up a tiny drop in solar energy in the climate models. This drastic problem, pointed out during the early stages of the last sunspot maximum in 2012 and 2013, was finally rectified in 2017 when the official particle data set was released to the community. This problem right here is why they're making the changes. While so far, nobody has been able to publish a study showing massive human contribution or catastrophic future warming while using these new data sets, the people who are publishing are doing so at the highest levels and in the highest forums of geophysics. This is why this chart is so critical. The 1900s saw the greatest solar activity, according to three different isotope records, since the high activity that ended the last ice age. The grand solar cycle is set to bring less CMEs, more cosmic rays, and a vastly different external energy environment for our planet for the rest of the century. With magnetic activity already indicating that this may be the last proper sunspot cycle coming before the plunge into grand minimum. There's more to come on why the climate game is inches away from changing forever. Be safe, everyone.